when my twin sister and I integrated a uh, all-white public high school in 1968, 17 blacks among 700 whites. Mm-hmm. And I tell that story about me being sprayed by a fire hose by a teacher in class and call the N-word every day. But injustice is injustice, whether it's 1960 or 2020. Mm-hmm. And I said, what we have to do is to harness your power. Secretary Espy, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks. Glad to be with you this morning. Thank you. So Mississippi hasn't had a Democrat in the U.S. Senate in over 30 years, and you started off this race behind, but a recent poll shows you within just about 1% of your opponent. Where do you think that that support is coming from right now? And do you think that you've gotten enough support from the Democratic Party on a national level helping you here? I'm going to answer that first question with a quote from Reverend Barber. You have Reverend Barber with the Poor People's Campaign? (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said to me, I was on a Zoom call with him recently, and he said, Mike, Mississippi is not so much red as it is unorganized. What it means is that uh, had there been investment in this state, you know, in data uh, development and in uh, uh, researching and getting candidates to run for office, I mean, we would we would have had much much um, more recent progress in Mississippi when it comes to Democrats and progressive candidates in office and running for office. So. Uh, I ran 18 months ago for the U.S. Senate in the same uh, race against the same incumbent, you know, for a special election. And we only had six months to run. We were the last race in the entire country. And we still, although we had to announce our candidacy, stage a campaign, find the staff, train the staff, build the money, we got 47% of the vote. 47% mm-hmm. of the vote. So so uh, we have... Um, we have uh, more black voters per capita in Mississippi than any state in the nation. So let's yeah. start with that. Uh, in order to win this time, uh, I think I had to run, have run before to win this time. Yeah. We had to build a track for our locomotive to run, build a runway for our plane to take off, and build that bridge so I could cross it, and mm-hmm. others behind me. So we'll built it now, uh, because I didn't start running once I lost last time. So we've got something amazing here built. and. What we have to do is uh, continue to build the largest, highest, deepest, most robust coalition in Mississippi's history to get out of vote here in about five weeks. So we have to raise 3% more in black turnout. Yeah. So instead of 32.5% as we got 18 months ago, I really believe that we're going to get more than 3%. So we need to go from 325 to at least 35 yeah. So with Mike Espy having been more experienced, with the younger folks know that even though I've got gray hair, I've done some things in Mississippi and now they know the story of me integrating the public high school and all of that stories that you've read about. Mm-hmm. And with Kamala Harris on the ticket and Joe Biden, I really think that's the magnet we need to, uh, to get that 3% increase. And then we have to go from uh, 18% white vote to about 22. Mm-hmm. In our latest poll, uh, we have, uh, we've, we're right now at 20 strong SP. So we only need 2% more. So the poll you mentioned, I really believe the, I love the trajectory because we did a poll in February. We were nine points down. Mm. We did one in early August. We were wow. five points down. Then this most recent shows us that we are one point down. And if you look at, if you go in the weeds, you can see that we have, we're plus eight points with white independence. We're equal to her with all white voters below the age of 35. Mm-hmm. Now we have a solid 20%. So we're creating that coalition that, that we need. And so I think as for um, a confluence of factors, there's a reason why. First of all, George Floyd's murder, mm-hmm. shocked the conscience, yeah. and it let all the young people know uh, it's okay to be angry, it's okay to protest, but let's cause, uh, let's morph the anger and the protest until maybe even something long lasting, go ahead and elect someone who not only looks like you, but who understands systemic racism in America. You don't have to talk so much about police misconduct. Whoever you elect already knows that exists and let's just work to solve it. Mm -hmm. Then we have the Mississippi flag, which is um, yeah, that Confederate emblem on it. That was taken down in about, I'm gonna say two months. Yeah. Over this summer, I, I'm mm-hmm. 66. I never thought that flag was coming down. Yeah. That came down because the SEC 
And the NCAA said, we're not, we're not going to play any postseason events in your state until that come down. Mm -hmm. We had some African-American football players saying, we're not going to play under that flag. Mm -hmm. You have people like me out saying, uh, it is inhibiting global companies coming to Mississippi that flies a flag that's disuniting and it's reminiscent of a hateful age. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so that thing came down and that just shows that people now want a leader to represent the Mississippi that's going now into the third decade of the, of the 21st century. And then the last element, and I'll stop and answer your other question is, uh, of course, the unfortunate death of Judge Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. That showed everybody around the nation, all races are in play. Right. All races deserve notice. Mississippi with its, you know, ugly past can be lifted with more infrastructure, like Reverend Barber said, give us revenue mm -hmm. and we can pull out the greatest black voter turnout in Mississippi's history. And we can elect someone that's gonna protect the Affordable Care Act, that can make sure we have Medicaid expansion, to make sure we can look and take care of the heart disease and the cancer and all of the maladies of those who are very low income and can't pay the hospital bills. So I'll say to you, it's happening now because we are credible, mm -hmm. shown through the polling, showing as a result of our last uh, cycle campaign, a lot of these issues that are external, the flag and Justice Ginsburg mm -hmm. and George Floyd and the others. And, um, and, and uh, just, we've laid the infrastructure now. So the revenue we get in, we know where to put it. We've got to mm -hmm. get, build that 3% black vote up and stay on the air to persuade two more percent of the white population that I'm their guy as well. Yeah, I mean, healthcare has been a really huge part of your campaign this year, in particular, expanding Medicaid for Mississippi. So can you talk a little bit about why that's so important, especially in your state? It's important in our campaign because you're right, Akilah, it's the number one issue in our state. Even now during the pandemic, I mean, we are a small state with just about 3 million people, but now we've got 3,000 of those folks dead. Mm -hmm. 90,000, almost 100,000 having been infected. And of course, in almost every other state, there's a disproportionate impact on African American. Yeah. So what we have to do is, um, is lift up the bottom third. I tell everybody, I'm a senator. I will be a senator for every woman, regardless of age, race, gender, income, sexual orientation. Look, I don't care. If I'll be accessible and available. But I'm going to focus on lifting the capacity of those yeah. in the bottom third of our economic strata, in education, in job opportunities, and in healthcare. The reason we're so low, the reason we're number 50 and last, and people are so tired of being last, right. is because that bottom one third is so low. So we just lift it. Then we lift the fortunes of Mississippi from 50 up to, you know, within midpoint. Mm -hmm. So we have to do it first with health care because everything leads from health care. Yeah. If you're sick, you can't learn. If you're sick, you can't work. Right. So if, and if you're sick, you have to be able to pay your bills. Mm -hmm. So we're one of 13 states without Medicaid expansion. All we have to do is just go and, and this is a legislative prerogative, a state prerogative. But as a federal legislator, I can say I'm going to be the health care senator. I want to prod our legislature to do what Oklahoma and Missouri, what they've already done. These yeah. are similarly situated conservative states. Right. Recognize that if we just get a program to be empowered here in Mississippi, what 90% of those bills are financed by the federal government, then that just lifts everybody. And even when you have your ailments, when you feel the onset of them, you won't be afraid to go to the doctor because you have the right. money to pay the bill and because you can pay the bill, there's a uh, there's enough largesse there for the rural hospitals to to cover the uncompensated care portion and enable these hospitals to remain open. So right. that's the number one issue in the campaign because it's the number one issue in Mississippi: cover pre-existing illnesses, yeah. Medicaid expansion, prescription drug costs lowered, rural hospitals open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and give everybody accessible, affordable health care. We know how to do it. It's already there. It's called the ACA. We've got to protect it. I'm going to do yeah. that. 
And on another issue, you mentioned Justice Ginsburg. So I wanted to ask you about the Supreme Court briefly. Some of your potential Democratic colleagues in the Senate aren't meeting with Trump's Supreme Court nominee and are speaking out about the, the timing of it being so close to the election. How would you treat this entire situation? And I think what Mitch McConnell and the Republican senators are doing is really, really unfortunate because it, it disrespects the American people. I mean, we've got an election here in uh, five weeks. And here in Mississippi, a state that I care about, uh, the voting, its voting's already started. Right. right. We have in-person direct voting for those who are age 35 and above, those who are disabled, and those who won't be in Mississippi or their home county on November 3rd. So the lines are really long here. So those folks have no say. They have no say. So I really think, and I have been saying, and I'm emphatic about this, I think that we're just five weeks out. Yeah. So we can wait until we get a new president named, mm -hmm. a new president elected. And then that president ought to nominate his uh, person for this important lifetime position. And then we'll have a new Senate and hopefully I'll be a part of it. And then we can confirm that that Supreme Court nominee. So it just, they're just ramming it through. Yeah, It's a direct risk to the issue we just spoke about healthcare because in yeah. November 10th, this is the appeal of, uh, of Obamacare and, and uh, um, of the ACA and I wanna be there. But that's why they're ramming it through. They want to repeal Obamacare, repeal ACA, repeal coverage for pre-existing conditions mm -hmm. and affect in Mississippi 600,000 of those who have pre-existing illnesses and 500,000 already who enjoy coverage uh, from the ACA and it's wrong. We mentioned the conversation about ACA and healthcare related to the Supreme Court, but the other question that you know people have had about what this could all mean is how it would affect Roe v. Wade and abortion access throughout the country. So what is that conversation like in a state like Mississippi where, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would assume that you know some potentially more conservative voters might have their certain beliefs about it? Right, so I've seen a poll lately, it was a, a state poll very well respected, that, um, that when it comes to issues of uh, you know, pro-choice and pro-life, that even in Mississippi, the those that favor pro-choice, uh, they're beginning to to dominate uh, in their in their beliefs. Uh, but uh, you know, the candidate I'm running against is ardent, ardently uh, pro-life. Uh, I will I will tell you, and I will tell you honestly here again. Uh, if someone, I've I've got a daughter, I've got three children, one one female, two two men. So I tell everyone that uh, now honestly. If she came to me, it was in a certain type of situation uh, uh, where this question was was critical. Yeah. Uh, I'd probably I'd probably say let's go ahead and have the have the baby, you know, let's just incest or rape something like that. If it's if it's anything other than that, I would probably say, you know, we will help you take care of the child. What's the problem? Let's go back to school and all of that. But that's that's what that's my choice. But at the same time, I recognize if she would if she would choose against my advice, I would say to her, "You're an adult. Mm -hmm. It's a lawful choice. I'll stand behind you as my daughter. I'll mm -hmm. stand behind you as having made a lawful choice. Rule be is the law of the land, and uh, and let's let's go forward." And so I would say, honestly, that I am, I am, uh, I'm pro-choice when it comes to the lawful decision, although when it comes to uh, making that crucial choice with your husband or your mate or your, your physician or your minister, that, that's up to you. So we're in the middle of a week where we had our first presidential debate uh, with just, you know, the final two nominees. And I'm sure you've seen that Donald Trump refused to condemn white supremacy in the debate. And he and his campaign have you know, I would say attempted to clean it up since, but that doesn't mean that they've outright said, like, we, uh, we've changed our position and we denounce it. <laughs> the senator you're hoping to unseat in Mississippi has said some heinous, racist comments in the past. Obviously, this is a different kind of election year than any in my lifetime, for many people in, you know, memory at all. 
And with the president refusing to rebuke white nationalism, which obviously should be disqualifying in the year 2020, how can we as a country move forward even after November? Great question, great question. Well, I watched that debate last night as you did, obviously, and I was shocked. And uh, when, when he was asked that question about uh, rebuking, mm -hmm. you know, white supremacist, he said, um, you know, he said, back, back down and stand down and stand aside or something like that. Yeah. You know, instead <laughs> of just, just coming out and uh, doing the right thing, you know, um, it reminded me of an earlier response of his when, um, when they asked him, did he, did he rebuke David Duke? Mm -hmm. And he said, David Duke, who's David Duke? Right. And I had heard him today and he says, uh, you know, I don't even know who they were talking about last night, you know, so, right. so he's trying to back it up. He knew, he knows he stepped in it. And, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, this is the same president that called the African continent mm -hmm. full of SO countries. Mm -hmm. And I demean women and immigrants and all of that. So we know that he's doing all this for a reason. Yeah. He's uh he's trying to he's trying to uh trying to stir up the culture wars here here in mm -hmm. America, and it's wrong. I mean, we need a we need a president as a figure of a of a nation that's unifying and that just pulls everybody together. And that's why I'm so happy here in Mississippi that we we took down that flag. Right. I mean, that flag was reminiscent of a day when one human being could own another human being. Mm -hmm. And yet it's still flying for 163 years. Right. I'm running against a senator who in 2014 now was a statewide official. She was commissioner of agriculture, just as I was US Secretary of Agriculture. Yeah. She went to the Jefferson Davis Museum. She went there, she tried on the little rebel cap with that star in the middle. She tried on the waistcoat. She held a Confederate era rifle. Now, let me stop and say, if you want to go to the museum of whatever ilk, that's fine. The Mississippi flag is not in a museum. If you want to see it, go to the Civil Rights Museum. That's right. where it belongs. Mm -hmm. But then when she left the museum, she said, this was the best of Mississippi's history. Yeah. She said that. Mm -hmm. You go to our website, sbforsenate.com, it's all over there. So we have a senator mm -hmm. who said 2014 that that was the best Mississippi history. Not, not 1914, no. 18, she said it 2014. So I tell you, it is not a person who should represent Mississippi going into the third decade of the 21st century. No, she's holding us back. That's why all the young folks age 35 and below are for me. Mm -hmm. That's why all the Black Lives Matter folks are for me. Mm -hmm. That's why the upperly mobile, better educated, mm -hmm. those that make up that 20%, they're for us, because they know I'm gonna represent everybody. You know, Fannie Lou Hamer lived and died for the right to vote. I spoke this weekend in the Vernon, Vernon Damer Park, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. You know, Vernon Damer was firebombed mm -hmm. just, for, just for exhorting others to vote. I believe they died for a new flag. They died for open voting. Right. They died to, to against voter suppression. And so I am somebody that wants everyone to vote, everyone to feel like they're living on a welcoming symbol, mm -hmm. and everyone to just unify. And so I would say in answer to your last question, we just need people who don't believe in divisiveness, right. people who whatever choices an individual makes, acknowledges that that's the choice that they made. Right. And I will represent everyone regardless of that choice. That's absolutely right. All right. Last thing to the point that we were just talking about before, obviously this is a state that Trump won. And so I would assume that some of the folks that you talked to may have been sympathetic to Trump before or are currently still sympathetic, but or maybe wanted to hear what you have to say. What are those conversations like? And have you had the opportunity to talk to any of those people since the debate? You know, have they have they said, what the hell was this guy talking about? Honestly, I'm sensing a difference and as we're seeing it in our poll. Mm -hmm. uh, President Trump and my latest poll has lost eight points of Mississippi, eight. Wow. Uh, and so, I mean, he's still beating Joe Biden, but not nearly by as much as he beat Hillary Clinton. 
Right. And then we've, we've gotten down into the weeds. And now those folks are ashamed that he called out veterans, uh, losers and suckers, right? Mm -hmm. He did that. They remember when uh, this is a Bible Belt state, and he, uh, in answer to a question about did he pray, he said, well, um, he said, I've not done anything of which to be forgiven. Wow. Those things, those things stick. Yeah, and I mean, they're just indefensible. He's the last women. So I think there's an aggregate impact now on all of this. And so now when, he's, when he does win, and I don't think he will, I think, I think they're gonna miss the judges and all that. But as far as the personality there, they know what he said about COVID, that it was a democratic hoax that it was government still to disappear. And so it's still around us here in Mississippi and they know he lied to them. Mm -hmm. So these, this is just error after error, laugh to lie compounding. And I think now uh, that's why he's lost eight points. Yeah. And last night yeah. was, was uh, another example of his boorish behavior, his bullying tactics and someone maybe who knows he's lost and he's just flailing around, breaking China like a bull in a China shop. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious, you know, we're millennials. We're <laughs> getting more and more political power and voting in larger numbers. Uh, and Gen Z is finally being represented in the polls in a real way. And so as a person from the South, I'm from Kentucky, which I think okay. to you all, I'm a Yankee. But, <laughs> but regardless, I do think that there has been a conscious effort uh, in our generation to sort of reframe the narrative that this country has about the yes. South. And so have you felt in your own campaigning that young people who are joining your campaign and are out there, you know, speaking to people and voters about the issues that you care about and trying to, you know, make sure that people are empowered to vote. Do you feel that, you know, this time around that that's more, you've seen more of that or that it feels more impactful because young people are finally gaining that power? What I think I've done more in this campaign is to connect my story to their story, connect what I went through four years ago during Jim Crow, Mississippi, to, uh, to their sense of injustice, all right? And it's really the same. It's, uh, it's, 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 it represents itself in different forms, but injustice is injustice. Someone who feels superior to you whether it's 1960 or 2020, it's, it's the same uh, vestige of, of uh, visceral mm -hmm. superiority, okay? So I tell my story when my twin sister and I integrated a uh, all-white public high school in 1968, 17 blacks among 700 whites. Mm -hmm. And I tell that story about me being sprayed by a fire hose by a teacher in class and call the N-word every day almost and fighting every day. I'm running from a fight every day. And I, you know, I say I'm not John Lewis and I'm not Bernard Damer, but I've had my experiences and I connected to them. Mm -hmm. And I said, what we have to do is to harness your power. That sense of, uh, that sense you have of violation, that sense you have of, uh, of, of loss and that anger you feel about social injustice in your days must be harnessed to something permanent, right. which is voting, whether it's for a mayor that, that, that fills a pothole in the black community mm -hmm. or somebody that wants to help you graduate from school with no debt or somebody that goes to Washington to vote for the Affordable Care Act. So when you break your arm, you only have to pay 10% of that bill instead of 90, you know? Right. I think I've done that now. So we've harnessed, I think, millennial um, favor. Mm -hmm. We are, that's why with white millennials, those under 35, we're there with them now. Mm -hmm. uh, the the, the, the uh, civil rights community, they've always been for us. The openly mobile white women, how better educated in the suburbs now, seem to be coming this way and we just got to stitch it all together yeah we've got five more weeks and we're we're uh two right more there. points white and black turn out three more points and we'll we'll be there well secretary Espy, thank you for talking to us we really appreciate it thank you so much thank you <laughs>